I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I'll cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best song. Faithful, loving service to, to him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He, your savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Amen. Thank you, Father for that great love that indeed lifted us. I pray, God, you'd be with the service this morning, this afternoon even. I pray, God, that you would uh, help me, Lord, give me clarity of mind. Lord, help uh, your words to flow forth in such a way that they be understood by those that are here. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy, your love, your long-suffering towards us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, you can be seated. <coughs> John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I was going to use this passage just as, a, as an aside in, in uh, what I'm talking about this afternoon. Um, but it's just, it's, it's such a, a gripping passage. I just wanted to walk through it in its entirety. Um, this would probably be what's best described as the Lord's Prayer. Though, though traditionally we, we take uh, an example prayer from the Beatitudes and we, we apply that as the Lord's Prayer. Though I think this would be more fitting because it is in fact the Lord himself praying unto God the Father for us. It's a magical, wonderful, perfect, amazing moment in the, in the, in the Christian uh, scriptures which record God through Jesus and his great love for us as, as he cries out to the Father in prayer. If you look in John chapter 17, the Bible says, These words spake Jesus... And lifted up his eyes to heaven and said. So Jesus is making that, that famous posture where in humility even he looks up. He lifts up his eyes unto the Father in heaven and says this. He says, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son that thy Son also may glorify thee. And this is not only Christ's biggest goal in this scripture and in his life and in his walk upon this earth, but it ought to be ours as well, that we would glorify the Father. Let your light so shine before men 
that they, being the world, may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Ye are salt, ye are light, in order that your good works, in order that your good deeds would bring glory to God in the sight of all men. Indeed, Jesus himself seeks that he would be glorified in order that he would also bring glory unto God in this moment. Verse 2, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So we, hear, so we see here the transition taking place where by all power has been given Christ over all flesh, at this time in order that he would give eternal life to as many as would have them. This is the servant Christ who is now asking for all power to be given unto him, both in heaven and in earth, in order that eternal life would be granted unto others. In other words, he's taking that step from servant to Lord. He's taking that step from uh, humble servitude unto the people around him and now praying that God, as he had given him power over f all flesh, would now transport that, transfer that in such a way whereby eternal life would be given to as many as would receive it. Verse 3 says this, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And eternal life is plain, it's this. Eternal life isn't just some abstract thought or some position or something that is retained by, by some man. No, eternal life is this. It is knowledge of the only true God and Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, it's not just abstract. It's actually a relational thing. Eternal life is. Eternal life is that you may know the true God. You may know Jesus Christ who was sent. And that is life eternal in a nutshell. That is the embodiment of it. It's not just a possession, though. Yes, it is a possession. It's so much more, though. It's, it's knowledge. It's relational. It's a position whereby we are in the know with the great true God, as well as Jesus Christ, his son. So much more than the abstract. So much more than just a thought, a concept, or a position. But why do we have this even available to us? Verse 4 says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. The only reason we have access to this eternal life is because of what Christ just said here. He has glorified the Father by finishing the work which he was given of the Father to do. In that humble attitude, Christ took upon flesh and glorified the Father within flesh with all power given him over it. And in doing so, he completed what was required as far as the work in the flesh in order that he would facilitate salvation, in order that he would allow for eternal life, in order that we would know God the Father and Jesus Christ who was sent. Verse 5 says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. And they have kept thy word. Here we see eternal life. Yes, it is that relationship with God the Father. It's so much more than that even where it's this out of this world power that is given unto men. Look how it says in verse 5. The glory was before the world was, it says. And then it says, I have manifested thy name unto these men who thou gavest me out of the world. What I believe is being described here is that these men had to be plucked out of the world in order that they would receive that glory that was imparted before the world ever was. Jesus Christ now just asking in prayer that that same glory that he has always had before the world, that outlives the world, that is out of this world power, would be received back unto him in order that he would take those that belong unto the Father out of the world and that he would give them, receive them unto himself. That eternal life is that out of the world power. It's that glory before the world. It's that same power that takes a man that is wrapped up within this world, within this, 
this uh, system within the, the, the spinning globe that we have and the, the, the cares of it. It takes them and plucks them out of it, passes eternal life unto them as they enter into the relation with the Son. And the Son receives that same eternal life again unto him as he asks to be glorified in this moment. Verse 7 says this, it says, Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. And isn't it true that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights? Now Jesus is praying, understandably, with, with the earnest idea that, hey, they already understand this. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them, and they have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. The, the full understanding here was received by the apostles, the knowledge that all things are given of the Father because they have believed what the Word of God says here. Those all things, I believe, are wrapped up in part and parcel with verse 8 where it says, The words which thou gavest me. When they received the words, they received them by faith. In the same way that we receive salvation, the same way that we receive all things. It's based on the promise of God. And these men now know surely the truth that Christ came from the Father and that he is there with that specific task given him that the Father did send unto them. As you continue reading down in verse 9, it says, I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Here, because we have this life that is out of this world, because we have this life that outlived the world, this eternal life, the world is not considered to be a part of us. And therefore, even in this moment, Jesus Christ does not find it needful to pray for the world. He's praying specifically with the world without his mind. He has no regard for the world at this time. Rather, he is praying for those that have received him up to that point, as well as those that will receive him in the future. And his prayer is this. Since I am no longer in the world, Father, but these are here, I'm coming to thee, Father. Holy Father, that thou wouldst keep thine own through thy name, those that have been given unto me. God here is calling out to the Father. Jesus Christ is calling out to the Father, recognizing that soon he will not be of this world. Soon he has to return to where he was before the world began, before the incarnation. He is going to return there. But he is saying, Father, I understand this, and this is why I ask in prayer that you would keep them, that you would help them, that you would guide them and lead them and care for them in this moment. And this is the one part where you see in the whole Bible, and I have it highlighted myself, where it says, Holy Father. Don't call any man Holy Father in this world, though we know there's a religion out there that does that, Catholicism. No, the Holy Father is the one that Christ is praying unto right now. It's not some man in the dress. Holy Father is the one who sinned in heaven. He did not leave heaven, but rather sent his Son to be the propitiation for the world. And we'll learn more about that as we read on. But he is there waiting for Christ who has now prayed unto him, asking that those that are his, those that are separate from the world positionally, would have the sustaining power of God the Father on their lives, though Jesus Christ has to go away for a moment. Verse 12 says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have joy fulfilled within themselves. So this word is now being spoken into the world. Christ here admits that he kept them by his power up into a time. The disciples, the men that were with him, those that were given unto him, and none were lost. 
He fulfilled the keeping of them to the uttermost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So unless God promises otherwise, he is promising care for those that are his own. The son of perdition being the special case whereby he would be used in such a way to fulfill the scriptures, having Christ betrayed as he was about to within the garden after this prayer takes place. And now I come to thee, in verse 13, and these things speak I unto the world that they might, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. The purpose of this prayer now is starting to become evident. He is coming to the Father, asking that the Father's glorifying of himself, as he pulls Christ out of this world, he would return the same care that Christ offered unto the world, just for, not the world in its entirety, but those that are his own, who Jesus says, they are yours and they are mine. In other words, they are one and the same in Christ, in the Father, save blood-bought children and those that would come after them. So now he is speaking that care over his flock into the world that they might have joy fulfilled within themselves. His purpose is to send that joy unspeakable and full of great glory into the hearts of the believers. This prayer almost seems like a somber type of prayer, especially at this moment, where he's saying, I, I am not going to be here, Father, to care for these. I need you to care for them, and I'm speaking this unto you. I have come unto you, Father, that they might have my joy fulfilled within themselves. This is John chapter 17. This is that famous Lord's Prayer. And we've always, uh, I believe, the actual Lord's Prayer, where God is crying out unto the Father in order that he would be glorified with the same glory that was manifested before the world, in order that his own would be glorified in that same fashion, with joy fulfilled within themselves. Verse 14 says, I have given them thy word. And the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Again, that parting line is being drawn in the sand, and it's being revealed very clearly that those that are in Christ are even as I am in the, am not in the world. That's what he says here in verse 16. He says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He is dividing the lines. He is setting up the idea that, hey, there is the world and then there is my own. I'm going to pray for my own. I'm not going to pray for this world. Why? Because this world hates my own. They hate me. And even because the word that I have given them is, is an affront to them, it is offensive to them, have they hated me. Though I'm not going to pray that they should be removed from this world. Why? Because there are those that would follow after, those that would hear, those that would receive that same salvation and enter into that separate group, enter into that separate part, enter into the lot among the believers. This is why I don't want them to be removed from the world, but rather thou shouldst keep them from evil. In other words, care for them, Father. Love them. Father, give them what is needful, Father, protect them, watch over them, help them to be in the world, but not of the world. And how does this happen? It happens through sanctification. Verse 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And so Christ brings the word, he gives it unto the world in order that they would be sanctified through it. And this is the same thing that happened unto Jesus Christ at this time. Look at this in verse 18. It says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them unto the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So what happened here was that sanctified example was set forth along with that word that provides sanctification in order that we, in order that others, in order that anyone who would call upon the name of the Lord would be sanctified in that same fashion. Jesus is praying in John 17 that the Father would protect, 
but also that the Father would bring that word to the people that would sanctify them through the truth, which is the word, and Christ himself became that example that we should follow after him, that we should live in that same manner as he, as he did. As it says in verse 19, for their sakes, in other words, for our benefit, Christ sanctified himself. He set himself apart. He was not of the world. He was in the world, yes, but not of it. He preached. He did miracles. He helped. He, he mended the sick. He, he was a, a constant witness unto the Father. In order that that same example would be followed after those that would believe afterwards. Verse 20 says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And here's his ultimate purpose, is order that his own would stay within the world. They would be empowered by the words of God that sanctify through the truth, the word being the truth. In order that when they go out, they would tell that same story. They would act in the same way that Christ did in order that the story would have power behind it and the life-changing abilities and, and empowerment of the Spirit, of the Word of God sanctifying them, would be clearly seen. Christ here says, I'm not praying for the world, but I'm praying for these, and I'm also praying for these that will believe on me through these own word as they preach the gospel, as they teach all nations to believe on Christ and all statutes, all judgments, all truths of the scripture enter into them and they are sanctified thereby. And his purpose, his goal is that those that are believers now that he is praying for and those that are going to believe afterward that he is also praying for would be one. And here's the example that the Father is in me and I in thee. That's what he says there in verse 21. He says that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, to the end, here it says, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The whole purpose of Christ's ministry was that the whole world would believe that Jesus Christ has sent them. And in the last days, you're going to see the whole world believing that the Father has sent Jesus Christ. The problem is that there's going to be many people believing on the wrong side of reprobacy, where their minds are evil afflicted to the point where when Christ returns, they're going to blaspheme the Son of God and pray that the mountains and rocks would fall upon them, recognizing it's Jesus Christ returning. The whole world will eventually receive that testimony, but God's will is not that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So his purpose in coming, again, in this prayer, it is highlighted. He says, Father, glorify me that you may be glorified. This same glory has spanned throughout all eternity. I have plucked these out of the world in order that they would carry forth your sanctifying word. And now, Father, I am praying for these that are saved now, that I have rubbed elbows with, that I have embraced, that I have loved, that I have cared for, these few disciples. But I'm also praying for those that would follow thereafter. This is my desire, is what Jesus Christ is calling unto the Father for. If we pray in the same way, we can have that same desire upon our hearts, and the Father God will answer in the same fashion with the affirmative, because this is what God wants. He wants to get says in verse 24. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. He wants all of us to be united in the same love of God. That same love that was before the foundation of the world, that everlasting love, that everlasting life, that life that is, in, that is essentially, like it says in verse 3, this is life eternal, that they might know thee and the only, tr the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. His purpose is that they would know as Christ knows that same relationship with the Father, whereby they know on an intimate, 
Father, Son, um, in just powerful way, the love of God the Father, that eternal love, that eternal life that dwells within the believer. And this is Christ's whole purpose. He says, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee. And that's apparent because he's not even praying for them. They don't know thee, Father. They don't want to know thee. But I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And verse 26 says, And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. The same great love that speaks in John 3.16 and Romans 5.8, that same great love that reverberates through John the Beloved's epistles when he just talks about the love of God which constraineth us, the love of God which passeth all knowledge, the love of God, that same love, here Jesus is trying to plead with the Father that these could experience it. When he's talking about those, he's talking about the apostles, the disciples, those who are with him right now. But you know who he's also praying about? He's also asking about not only these, but those which shall believe on me through their word. And today, we read the words of those men that Christ says had an intimate relationship with me. And though Christ said, I can't be here forever, but I will pray unto the Father and he will presently send you another comforter. And that same comforter came and empowered the believers to go and to preach the gospel to many nations on that great day of Pentecost, taking the gospel far and wide upon the earth. Then these same men, by that same empowering spirit, through the act of prayer that Christ called down the spirit to to fill the void that he was leaving, that same empowerment used these men to write and pen and preach these words that we are reading even today. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle John, the Apostle Peter, uh, the Gospels to, to Timothy and Titus, th those different portions of Scripture that we read, it's because of a moment like this where Christ, in prayer, asked the God presently to send another comforter to fill the void that he was leaving. Though he said it was expedient. Why was it expedient that he would leave? Christ don't leave us, we would all think. Well, why is he leaving? Why doesn't he stay? Why doesn't he? He says it's expedient that I leave because if I leave, the Lord will presently send another comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. And that is the longevity of the plan from this moment unto where we're standing right now. The longevity of the plan is that the Holy Spirit of God would come down, filling the void that Christ's presence in the flesh had left when he ascended upon high and sits at the right hand of God the Father. That the Spirit and the longevity of the Spirit, which is not held down by flesh, which is not constrained by the cares of this world and by the woes and by the things that, that uh, Jesus Christ within a fleshly body would be limited by. Now the Spirit is like the wind, blowing whithersoever it listeth, going, teaching, bringing to remembrance all things whatsoever Christ hath taught us. And that is the fruition of Christ's ministry, the prayer to action that he called upon the Father to fulfill in this moment. And this is why we stand here with that same power, that same great love that declares the name of the Father and even now will declare as Christ charged that he would continue to do. And how is he doing it? He's doing it through us. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me, in other words, the love wherewith the Father had loved Jesus may be in them, us, as I am in them. So Christ didn't leave us. He didn't leave us comfortless. He didn't leave us without, without a ministry, without care, without a purpose. He is, through the ministry of the Holy Ghost, still dwelling within us, His love dwelling within us, that same great love that He used to preach the gospel to every portion of what we would call the Holy Land, every portion of what we would call Israel and Judea and all those manner of places. That same love is available unto us and what can be known of us. And it is greatest manifestation of it is when we do it in unity. This is why Christ through this is saying, Father, as you are in me and I are in you, I want them to be one in me. I want them to be in unity. And there's no greater joy, there's no greater ministry than when Christians in unity go out and preach the gospel one with another. It's literally the stamp of the New Testament church is that we would take that united front with the love of God in our hearts 
we, knowing God, would declare that same knowledge of God, that God would be glorified, as it says in verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do, and what a testimony would it be at the end of our lives if we could say the same thing. God, glorify me. Lord, take me home, that you would be glorified through that same ministry which I have done. Lord, I have finished the work which thou hast gave me to do. And that was the simple plea of Christ here at the end of his life, was that we would glorify the Father as he glorified the Father. And he didn't leave us comfortless in that. First of all, he gave us a church. He gave us a band of men and women that can work and labor one with another. But then he did even better. He took of his spirit and portioned it and put portions of it within each one of our hearts, giving us the fullness of the power from on high in order that we could do the great works that he has commissioned us to do. And that is our charge for Christ, and we see in this portion of Scripture his heart in the matter. He said in John chapter 9, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And later on in the portion of scriptures, like we said, we read that in uh, Matthew, in the Beatitudes. He said, ye are the light of the world. Christ is saying, I am the light of the world as long as I am in the world. But then he passes that charge off and says, ye are the light of the world. And men are to see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And it is in that same vein, it is in that same way, it is in the commands of Scripture and the prayer of God, his heart opened up before the Father, that we would walk. He wants us to be unified with the same purpose, and that purpose is to shed the love of God abroad into all the world. He's not praying for the world, neither are we praying for the world, but you know who we are praying for? The one that we can pluck out of the world the one that we can reach and we can pull them out of the fire in order that they would believe through our word that we received from the apostles, that they received from Christ himself. And when they believe, they are sanctified through the truth as we share it with them. And the word is truth. And that's the full fold ministry. That's the ministry of Christ. That is his last prayer unto the Father. The Lord's prayer was that we would glorify Father, the Father. We would work the works which he has sent us while it is day. Because the night cometh when no man can work. And he wants us to be that light. He wants us to be that truth. He wants us to be that beacon of hope unto the world in unity. Working together through the same purpose that Christ purposed when he fell on his knees and he asked God, God, glorify them. Glorify me. Glorify them in me. Help them to work the works which I have sent unto them. That you may receive the glory and that others would receive that same salvation that was imparted unto them. Father, care for them in this business. Heavenly